Well, today is Father's Day, and uh, we're going to resume our study of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And uh, previously, Pastor Colin preached to us on uh, Ephesians 5 up to verse 17. And actually, today we're going to take things slightly out of order, and we're going to be looking at Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 4. And then we're going to come back to Ephesians 5 uh, in the coming, week, coming weeks and cover that back off. Um, Okay, why don't we read this uh, passage together, Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. It's up on the screen. Here we go. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father, your word tells us that the sower went out to scatter seed. And Father, I pray this morning that our hearts would be that good soil which would receive the seed and it would spring up to eternal life. So Lord, would you open our hearts to receive you this morning? Would you open our ears to hear from you? And would you open our eyes to see the truth of your word? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a story about an algebra teacher who was concerned that his pupils were not really learning the material. Um, so he sent a note home with uh, the homework to the parents asking them not to do any of the homework which he had assigned to their children. And uh, the next day he collected in the work and inside one of the books there was a note to the teacher from one of the parents. And it said, it said this, it said, Dear Mr. Wood, I'm flattered to think that you could. Well, I wonder uh, how many young people here are taking exams at the moment. Maybe GCSEs or A-levels or maybe university exams. Anyone here? Raise a hand. Yep. Well, my son has just completed some uh, exams successfully, some 13 plus school entrance exams. And uh, I wonder how many of you know that uh, life-changing exams can be a worry for parents as much as for their children. But you know, whatever the outcome of exams, um, God has a plan. He has a plan to prosper. He has a plan not to harm you. And sometimes we just have to remind ourselves and our children about that promise, that God is sovereign in every situation and he works every circumstance to the good of those who love him. So as parents, we need to encourage our children. We need to set realistic expectations but we need to set high expectations for them as well and encourage them to rise up to those expectations. And uh, what about our spiritual children? I'm really encouraged by some of the things that have been happening uh, over the past uh, few weeks up here on uh, the platform uh, across the church and uh, especially with our worship, our prophetic uh, worship last week um, with uh, Chen Hui uh, stepping up and a couple of weeks ago also she was playing uh, the keyboard, and today Lydia uh, praying from the platform in the public worship, and also two of our youth last week, uh, Isabel and Ivy, helping to lead anointed worship here on the platform. And this is good, and I think we need to uh, continue to develop a culture where we see our spiritual sons and daughters through spiritual eyes, and we set uh, goals and expectations for them to rise up in the, in the expectation that they will. Someone say amen. Well, why is the subject of parenting and family so important in the letter to the Ephesians? Do you remember that I mentioned previously uh, that the practical message of Ephesians can be summed up like this? Christians get along. Christians get along. This is Paul's thrust in, this message, in his uh, letter to the Ephesians. And the reason that Paul is focusing on the family uh, it's because the family and relationships within the family are integral to the life of the church. The family is, if you like, a building block for the church. And it's true that nowadays families are more uh, geographically dispersed than they would have been in Paul's time. 
But with the aid of modern technology, we can keep in touch with family members across, across the globe. And I think the relational principles that Paul is setting out and he's outlining in this letter still hold true for us today, even if our families are not uh, local or living in the same household. Uh, it was my brother's birthday yesterday and I was uh, able to send him a message on Facebook. Even though he lives in Dublin, I don't see him very often, but with modern technology, I can easily keep in touch. Now, how many of you know that the parent-child relationship is a unique one? Your life began inside your mother. And uh, Psalm 139 reminds us that you knit me together in my mother's womb. And your mother went through a very painful childbirth to bring you into this world. And your parents are the ones from whom you inherit your DNA. And uh, you may inherit your parents' good looks. In the case of my son, he inherits those from his mum. You may inherit your parents' talents and aptitudes and giftings, and um, maybe if you're musical, your children will be musical, or if you're good at technology, they will inherit that aptitude. Uh, and of course, sometimes we can inherit uh, faulty genes as well um, from our parents, and they are passed down. Well, as infants and children, our parents are the ones who nourish us, they protect us, they educate us, they shelter us, at a time when we are unable to help ourselves. And for me personally, becoming a parent was a very eye-opening experience, especially the first year with our son, the sleepless nights. And the whole experience opened my eyes to all of the things that my own parents went through, the sacrifices, the pain, the money, <laughs> and also sharing your child's troubles and joys. And I imagine a few people on the back row can identify with what I'm saying and uh, are nodding their heads. And uh, last week we were celebrating uh, in the upper hall. Uh, it was Ian's first birthday, so congratulations to Nat and Andrew for making it through that first year, um, which from my experience is, uh, was the most tough, in fact. So how many of you know that godly parenting and a good home background provide a foundation for later life. A couple of years ago, the uh, Ministry of Justice published a study looking at childhood backgrounds of uh, the prison population. And they found that 25% um, of the sample uh, they looked at had been in care at some point as a child. 30% uh, had experienced abuse and 40% had observed violence at home as a child. So clearly what happens in the home has a significant impact on uh, children uh, throughout their lives. And a worrying trend is that uh, many children are brought up in homes when there is only one parent present. And according to government statistics, uh, in the UK last year, there were 2 million lone parents with dependent children, and 90% of those were mothers. They were lone mothers. And I know it can be very challenging for lone parents with young children, uh, especially those who don't have extended family living nearby who can uh, help with childcare. And I had some experience of this uh, personally when my son was younger, and my wife had to spend several months in hospital and I was grateful for, for all of the help which I received from uh, people in my uh, cells, uh, from EEC, um, but it was uh, quite tough. Let's just uh, acknowledge single parents this morning because they have a very difficult job to do. Um, so in my case, I was a single father, but in most cases, in fact, it is uh, single mothers who are left to look after children. And of course, it may be there is no one really to blame. Uh, sometimes the father has passed away. Um, in other situations, maybe the father is very abusive and the uh, wife uh, has no option but to remove herself and her children from that uh, situation. And sometimes, of course, the, the father simply walks out and won't take responsibility. 
But for whatever reason, uh, children are left without a father, and the mother must do what she can to bridge that gap. And uh, especially if she's bringing up a son, maybe by making sure there are other uh, male family members, maybe grandparents or uh, other uncles or maybe family friends who can act as a male role model to the child. So then the duties and responsibilities of children, which uh, Paul talks about in these verses. And Paul says that children should obey their parents. Uh, and he quotes from the Ten Commandments. Uh, and if we look back to Exodus 20, the commandments are divided up uh, into two sections, duties towards God and duties towards neighbor. And in fact, honoring parents is the very first duty towards neighbor. And Paul reminds us that there is a promise attached to this commandment that your days may be long upon earth. A long life is God's reward for honoring parents. And strong society results from strong family relationships. And we see uh, many strong cultures around the world where family is honored, such as the Chinese culture or the African culture or uh, indeed the Jewish culture as well. So how does honoring work in practice? How do you honor your parents? Well, I think there are a few things. Um, firstly, to honor parents is to take the warnings and instructions of your parents seriously. And sometimes today, children feel uh, peer pressure, maybe to do things or to go places uh, where their parents, uh, of which their parents would not approve. So maybe they end up deceiving parents, uh, lying to parents about intentions about where they're going. And uh, children lack the experience of maturity uh, if they're younger um, to know what is good. But deceiving our parents and uh, lying to our parents uh, is not honoring them. Who agrees with that? Amen. Um, I think secondly to honor parents is also to recognize that parents are not perfect. Um, we have to uh, forgive them in the law. They make mistakes. As a parent, I have made mistakes. Um, but um, my son also honors me by forgiving me. Um, to honor parents is also to remember them, uh, to help them in need, to send them a birthday card or a present, or indeed to remember Father's Day. Now, in Mark chapter 7, um, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees um, because um, they've made up these kind of um, man-made laws, these man-made traditions, and um, the effect is that it gets around their duty to help their parents. Um, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to, to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer uh, let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Now we're not Pharisees. But as children, I think we have to think about whether sometimes we might come up with our own uh, justifications for why we don't honor our parents, why we don't help them when they're in need, uh, and uh, for why other things might be more important or take precedence. And perhaps sometimes our motivation can simply be a selfish one. Another way in which we can honor parents is by taking care of them in their old age. And currently I have two grandmothers who are still living. Uh, one is, the younger one is 93 years old and the older one will be uh, 101 in a month's time. Um, but my uh, own parents are obviously getting uh, older themselves. They can't physically uh, cope with the demands of looking after their mothers in their own home. Um, but both of my grandmothers uh, are looked after in care homes, quite near to where my parents live, and my parents visit them most days. 
and uh, in uh, a few weeks' time, I'll be taking my wife and son to see my elder grandmother, and we will be celebrating her 101st birthday together. And uh, in John chapter 19, as Jesus is dying on the cross, we're told that Jesus sees his mother Mary standing next to John, the disciple whom he loves. And uh, Jesus says to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. Uh, And so even when we can't personally take care of parents, we can, like Jesus, make arrangements to ensure they remain well looked after. Um, What does Paul mean when he says obeying in the Lord? And why does it benefit us to obey our parents? Well, I think if we uh, obey our parents, especially as young children, we profit from their wisdom. And what is wisdom? Um, Wisdom can really be defined as a skill in living, skill in living. And like any other skill, it is developed over time. And in Luke chapter 2, we're told the boy Jesus went down with his parents and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Um, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, And also in Matthew 26, we're told that Jesus submits to his heavenly father. And Jesus provides an example Uh, to us. We all have an earthly father and we all have a heavenly father. And uh, perhaps like Jesus, your own earthly uh, father, uh, the person in that role is not your biological father, Um, but in the context context of the family, you should still honor him and you should still submit to him and you should still show that same honor that Jesus showed to Joseph. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Um, Why else should children obey their parents? Well, it's in the home that we learn to obey godly authority. And children who do not learn respect for authority in the home often find it hard to submit to legitimate authority later on, whether that be uh, at school or in the workplace uh, or sometimes even in obeying uh, the law as well. And... Um, obedience is really the true evidence of honor. The evidence that you honor someone is the fact that you obey them. And in Colossians uh, 3.20, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Um, But you may say, well, that's fine. Uh, I get all that. But what if my parents themselves are not very godly? What if they ask me to do something which is uh, not right? Um, Well, in Scripture, in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel is prophesying, uh, he says, um, I said to their children in the wilderness, do not follow the statutes of your parents or keep their laws or defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And also in Acts chapter 20, Peter and the apostles are brought before the uh, Jewish rulers, the Sanhedrin, and they are asked why they are still teaching in the name of Jesus when they have been commanded not to. And Peter and the apostles, the apostles reply, we must obey God rather than human beings. So uh, even though authority may legitim- be legitimate, uh, we are not to obey authority or instructions uh, which are clearly contrary to the word of God. Ultimate authority rests with God and with his word. And of course, obedience is something we associate more with younger children or with children who are living uh, at home. But honoring parents is something we should do for our whole lives. Um, So what about the duties and responsibilities of parents? So if the duty of children is to honor and obey their parents, what about the duties of parents towards children? 
Well, many parents make a conscious decision to have children. Um, some don't make a conscious decision, but have children anyway. Um, but in making that decision, parents should be fully aware that having a child will change their lives. And along with that decision go many important responsibilities. And I think the key is that parents need to build relationships, especially when their children are young. Um, there's a story about a military academy. And uh, because the cadets are finding life very tough, they decide to rebel and to go on strike. The lessons, the drill, the study hours, everything, they're not doing it. And uh, the word spreads. And the students begin receiving telegrams from their father. And one of them says, I expect you to obey. And uh, another one says, I'm going to cut you off without a penny if you disgrace your family in this way. Um, but then there's another uh, telegram which comes through from a father to a son, and it simply says this, um, steady on my boy, steady, father. I think there you can see there's a man who actually believes in his son, and I think it says a lot about um, a, the particular father relationship um, which exists in that situation, um, that um, a father can influence his son in that way. And you know, when strong relationships exist, sometimes strong words are often not required. And in this, re this context, I think about uh, Jesus and Peter. And before Jesus is arrested, uh, Jesus tells Peter that he will deny him. And Peter's really emphatic. He says, no, Lord, even if everyone else turns away, I will never deny you. Um, but uh, soon afterwards, uh, three times, Peter says that he does not know Jesus. And then what happens next? Well, the passage just tells us that um, as Jesus is walking along, uh, Peter catches his eye and they look. I think... You know, a look can communicate a lot. Um, have you ever received a look from your parents? If you're a husband, have you ever received a look from your wife? And I think when there's a, a strong relationship in place, sometimes, sometimes a look can say a lot. Um, in scripture, parents are commanded to train children. And uh, Proverbs 22.6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And looking back at the book of Samuel, how many of you know that um, David's family, King David, his family were somewhat dysfunctional? And uh, David's son, uh, Absalom, uh, he was what, what you might call a problem child. Um, he deliberately undermined his father. Uh, he tried to promote himself as king above his father. And he dishonored his father in many ways. And uh, he tried to raise, raise a revolt at Hebron. And David uh, actually had to go in hiding from his son in fear of his life. But uh, Absalom's army uh, were defeated in battle and Absalom himself was killed. And then what was David's reaction? Well, in the book of Samuel, it says, when he, when he hears the news, um, the king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he wept, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I, I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son. And sometimes when our children rebel against us, it can be difficult to maintain a father's heart. And uh, we can think, too, about the parable of the prodigal son, a son who had disgraced and dishonored his father by asking for his inheritance. And yet each day, the father is standing at the gatepost looking for his son to return. And, of course, this reflects the father heart of God towards us as well. Um, but although we should maintain a father's heart towards our children, 
It's also part of the duty of parents to correct and to discipline. Uh, and also in the book of Samuel, there is a warning to us. Um, in uh, 1 Samuel 2, we're told that Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Um, and for example, they were taking all the prime cuts of meat, uh, which were meant for the sacrifices, and they were committing adultery with uh, the women at the sanctuary entrance. And we're told uh, that the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. And uh, Eli is not pleased. Uh, he rebukes them, but his rebuke is mild and it's insufficient. And uh, Eli, in fact, imposes no punishment on his sons for their actions. Uh, he doesn't bar them from uh, ministering. They carry on doing uh, what they're doing. And I think this is where, as parents, we need wisdom. Parents must not be blind to the failures of their children. And as parents, we need to confront failings seriously. Um, some misdemeanors require more than uh, a verbal rebuke uh, if behavior is to be effectively corrected. Uh, and if in the end parents do not correct behavior, especially when children are young, they will get into uh, trouble at school, maybe even with the law. And we're not helping our children ultimately by withholding our discipline. Uh, in the case of Eli, um, Eli receives a prophecy from a man of God. Uh, the time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. No one in your family line will ever reach old age and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. So parents, we are to train up a child in the way he should go. Even, so that even when he is old, he will not depart for it, from it. And the duty of children is to honor your father and mother, that your days might be long in the land. And you can see here that Eli did not effectively discipline his sons. Uh, his sons did not honor him, and um, the dynasty was uh, cut short. But fathers must not only take a lead in disciplining their children, uh, especially sons, but they must also educate them in the things of God by their example. Um, for example, uh, how to pray. Um, for example, uh, regularly uh, attending uh, church, um, attending cell, uh, set a role model, be a role model to your son or your daughter. And too often, I think, um, spiritual matters are left to the mother. Fathers might provide some money, um, you know, they go off to work, they work long hours uh, or whatever, um, and, but then they, then they leave the spiritual side entirely to mum. But, you know, providing money, um, uh, providing a house, it's not a substitute for spending time with children. And fathers should affirm their sons as men of God and provide role models. Now, how many of you know that children can be provoked to anger by abandonment? Uh, where the father, father um, puts their work uh, ahead of their children. Sometimes even church things can be put ahead of children. And that makes children feel uh, abandoned, um, angry. Um, sometimes, for instance, when you're talking to your child and the phone rings. Um, if you go and answer that call... Um, you can give the impression to your child that the person who is calling is more important. There's a story about uh, a young man called Jack. And Jack had left home, and he married, and he had children. And he moved to another part of the country. And uh, one day, Jack's mum called him. And she said, Jack... Do you remember that old man who used to live next door? And Jack uh, thought for a while, and he said, yeah, I, I remember him. Yeah, he was a, he was a good friend of my father, and um, after my father died, I used to go around, and he'd tell me stories, and, well, he even taught me carpentry as well, and uh, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be uh, in business today as a carpenter. But 
I'd imagined he'd died uh, years ago. Well, anyway, Jack's mum told him that the old man uh, had died uh, just last week, and uh, Jack decided to fly home to attend the funeral. And it was a small event, as the old man didn't have uh, any children, and most of his friends had already uh, passed away. Anyway, after the funeral that evening, uh, Jack and his mum decided to go next door and just to take a look through the window of the old man's house. And um, Jack remembered that there used to be a little box sitting on the mantelpiece. And Jack said to his mum, well, it's gone. That little box that used to sit on the mantelpiece, it's gone. And whenever I asked the old man what was in that box, he wouldn't tell me. He just said, well, Jack, inside that box is the most precious thing. And then Jack's mum remembered. She said, oh, yes. She said, um, there was a delivery earlier today, and in fact, um, the old man left you that box in his will. He wanted you to have it. And uh, it's back at the house. So they, uh, they went back to the house, and uh, they found this little box. And Jack thought, well, I wonder what's in it. And uh, Jack opened the box, and inside the box, there was a gold pocket watch. And there was a note, and it said, uh, Dear Jack, thank you for your time, the most precious thing. And how many people know that time is very, very precious? You can't get time back. And how are you spending your time? How much time do you invest in your children? And you know, on their deathbed, nobody ever says, I wish I'd spent more time in the office. Paul says that fathers should uh, bring up children in the training and instruction of the Lord, and that takes time. What does it mean to bring them up? Um, well, to bring them up or to raise them up means to help them become independent, to bring them to a place of freedom, to where the child can make his or her own decisions. Um, and it's sometimes said that the job of a teacher is to, is to plan the demise of their own role. You have to think about that. But we let go of the reins gently, and we help our children develop confidence and independence. And uh, there's an American pastor, uh, Tim Keller, and he, he says this. He says, most parents, intrinsically, have always known it's their job to pass along their values. A good parent is somebody who does this. But what destroys a child's respect for the parent is not whether or not the parent is wise or smart or profound or orthodox. What destroys a child's respect for a parent is if the parent doesn't believe what he or she says and doesn't do any teaching at all. The experts will tell you that misdirected authority is nowhere near as devastating as no authority. So for a parent simply to say, uh, I don't know what's right or wrong, or who knows, or you can make up your own mind, that's actually much more damaging to a child than to be told things which are wrong. Because if you give the child the wrong kind of authority, at least then they will grow up and say, well, that was wrong, that was stupid, I'm going to find the right thing, uh, I'm going to know the difference between right or wrong for myself. But in fact, if you give a child no direction, if you give them no teaching authority, the child may, may grow up believing that there is no such thing as right or wrong. So they can't get to any place of critical freedom because they're never in a position to discern good from bad and wise from foolish. And if you like, they die from uh, a lack of authority. There's an old expression that uh, children are to be seen and not heard. I wonder how many people have uh, heard that expression before. Children are to be seen and not heard. Yes. Well, I think that ignoring children and uh, talking down to them harshly uh, is exactly really what Paul is talking about here. He warns us against that. Um, how do fathers train and instruct their children? And is there a difference between training and instruction? 
Well, training especially needs time. Uh, it needs impartation of wisdom through life's rough and tumbles. And uh, how does that take place? Well, many fathers only really train children or instruct them in uh, maybe academic studies. But actually being a good parent is primarily about being concerned for your child's whole spiritual well-being and also their character development. Um, parents are usually very keen to speak to teachers at schools about children's academic progress but they may be less interested in talking to uh, e-kids teachers, for instance, about their ch child's spiritual development. And uh, Proverbs 6 verse 20 tells us this. Um, it says, my son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And you know, parenting is not easy. Uh, it is a partnership between mother and father and it's also the responsibility of the whole church community for us to see that our children are encouraged and they are raised up in the things of God. Uh, and within the church community as well, parents with, with uh, children at different stages of development can share experiences with one another. And we should encourage one another as the whole family of God. Let's pray.